ராஜேஷ் <laughs> Over to you, Rajesh, sir. Please introduce the speakers. Good morning, sir, and good morning, uh, everyone. So, as uh, sir told, we have, we have a very important session for the postgraduate. Can you tell them? This is the topic of, for every anesthesia, like this, Abby. Edward, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, last week, we had, uh, we had a session regarding Abby assessment by Professor Dr. Comfort and Dekoran. And we had a very good message, I think, that difficult Abby. do occur because of the contextual uh, issues that means that as uh, the anesthetist uh, uh, number talented with the equipment which are available or unavailable equipment so today we have two dynamic an uh, anesthesiologist who are going to uh, show us about the airway gadgets and the supraglottic airway devices which are the main uh, uh, main equipment for the difficult airway management and uh, to introduce uh, before introducing them i would like to thank both uh, dr singhil and dr ram kumar for spending the valuable time here and uh, let's introduce dr singhil kumar uh, he is associate professor of, from department of anesthesiology uh, sri ramachandra medical college chennai uh, he is a faculty in various conferences and workshops those who attend uh, race conferences regularly you, you might have met him in frequent uh, because he is a uh is one of the coordinator in carry workshops for race and he has got lot of publications and he is a co-author in uh, year of anesthesiology booklet in one chapter also uh, we welcome you dr sendil for uh, presenting on airway gadget and um, uh, let me introduce dr ramkumar also he is also associate professor from uh, sri ramchandra medical college uh, chennai Uh, he is a gold medalist in various subjects during his uh, post uh, undergraduation and post graduation uh, he is also a very active participant in race and uh, array uh, workshops regarding the ramachandra academy and uh, he is a coordinator for uh, race cme book and he has got lot of national international publications and uh, interestingly he is author in uh, chapter for rehabilitation in head and neck uh, cancer surgery which is a very upcoming um, field in the book of rehab rehabilitation of cancer surgery and uh, he is a faculty for various array workshops in uh, national international courses and we welcome uh, dr sengil and dr ram kumar both of you and first we we'll start with dr sengil uh, regarding airway gadgets over to you dr sengil Dr. Sendhil, you can start your presentation. I'm here, sir. Dr. Sendhil, you can share your screen and start your presentation. Sindhil, you are live on. Sindhil, sir, you are live now. Please stop. Dr. Sindhil, you can start your presentation. Hello. Hello, Dr. Sindhil, you can start. Sir, I am not on. Yeah, yeah, sir, you're ready. Mr. Oh, good morning, everyone. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. Um, 
first of all i thank uh, dr edward johnson sir and dr rajesh sir for giving me this opportunity to talk in this uh, prestigious forum so the topic given to me is airway gap gaps so we all know airway management is the mainstay for every anesthesiologist so it is very important for us to know or understand the basic principle behind each and every equipment we use for airway management so for example if endotracheal tube is there it is very important for us to know why the tube is curved why there is a bevel what is the advantage of these things so when you know about these things it is very easy for us to manage to use the utmost usage of each and every equipment so it is mandatory for us to know all those things and uh, to be frank uh, this one hour won't be sufficient for uh, enumerating or uh, uh, talking more about airway gap gaps as far as possible i try to cover the most important very basic things which will be ma mandatory for uh, postgraduates during exams as well as some practical tips which is going to help us facilitate the better utilization of the airway gap gaps in this topic i'm going to cover a few things about the mask endotracheal tube especially the portex tube ray tube flexometallic tube microcuff tube double lumen tube airways and endotracheal tube introduced that is bougie so let us see one by one first and foremost is mask as you all know it's not a crime it's not a crime if we don't intubate but it's a sin if we don't mask ventilate so the most important thing is mask ventilation so we can save a patient with mask ventilation even if you are not not able to intubate so the mandatory thing is to know about mask and mask ventilation so this is the part uh, coming to the parts of mask these are all the three most important parts you can see the body of the mask which holds most of the air and uh, the amount of air which is going to retain here is called as dead space this is the seal if the seal is adequate only there will be adequate seal and we will be able to ventilate and this is the connector and retaining hooks these are all parts of the mask so this is a classic example of anatomical or closing uh, corneal mask the important thing is it is made up of rubber so it can we can mold the seal part whenever you are using see since it is uh, preformed uh, whenever you are going to use this mask you are supposed to adjust it or mold it to the according to the patient face facial contour then only the better utilization of this mask will be possible nowadays we are not using this mask we have been replaced by a uh, lot of uh, uh, silicon masks because the biggest dis disadvantage of this mask is it is not transparent so in case when you are ventilating especially in full stomach patient uh, accidentally you start ventilating if there is some secretions coming out or regurgitation you will not be able to identify the second important thing is the amount of air retained that is a dead space during when you are ventilating with adult patient with this mask it is not going to produce any trouble because the dead space of this mask is somewhere around 70 to 100 ml but whereas in pediatric cases the dead space is going to be uh, occupy some 30 to 40 percent of the tidal volume which we give which case in which case there might be hypoventilation so we should be very careful with while using this mask for uh, pediatric cases or we should go for appropriate pediatric mask these are all the uh, recently available uh, commercial uh, clear silicon mask which is uh, has advantage of uh, better seal and transparency so when it is transparent we will be able to identify the regurgitation and we can do the manipulation as we want then these are all the other uh, type of mask that is ambu transparent mask which has a uh, combination of anatomical mask and seal so that uh, it is transparent the dead space is less at the same time we can inflate or deflate to achieve adequate seal for the patient so better than the previously mentioned anatomical and clear masks coming to the important part in pediatric cases as i said the dead space is going to be the very important uh, problem while using this mask that's why we have this rendel backer sochak mask where the there there is no seal at all and the body of this part is going to be very very small so that we will be able to easily mask ventilate the patient uh, um, with uh, reduce very less dead space you can see here this pediatric mask unlike adult mask which have 70 to 100 ml this pediatric mask have a dead space of 3 ml 4 ml 8 ml and the maximum is 12 ml only is a dead space for this rbs mask so remember when you are ventilating a pediatric case especially with adequate or low tidal volume the dead space in the mask is going to be a biggest issue uh, to come for completion sake this is a commercially available endoscopic mask where you can see 
along with the mask on the top of the mask there is a opening fish mouth valve so while ventilating the patient itself we can put a endoscopy through this and we can do the maneuvering but uh, it need lot of expertise but instead of uh, uh, stopping the ventilation we can ventilate the patient and do the endoscopic procedure so now coming to the most important part we are having the gadgets varieties of mask but the most important part is how we are going to ventilate the patient so the commonly traditionally available technique that is c and e technique that is with one hand we are going to apply jaw thrust and head tilt and we are going to play uh, provide adequate tight seal with the finger with the thumb and index finger and we are going to uh, lift the jaw with the other three fingers this is a common traditionally uh, used c and e technique but in some situations where we are will not be able to provide adequate seal the jaw thrust where, for example where a patient is morbid obese with a heavy jaw we have to provide more work for adequate jaw thrust so that's why we are we can adapt some different techniques like the thumb and the thina remnants can be used for pressing the mask whereas all the other four fingers can be utilized for lifting the jaw so remember the common mistake which uh, the uh, first year post graduates do, do we daily encounter is they don't focus on jaw thrust so the most important thing is jaw thrust rather than tight fitting mask so this is called as te or thina remnants technique or two thumbs down technique that is we are going to utilize the entire work with the four fingers for jaw thrust whereas the thumb and thina remnants going is going to help us pressing the mask down these are all the three types of commonly available techniques uh, we are used the routine mask ventilation technique two hand technique and focusing more on jaw thrust in case if again there is some problem we can put the mask uh, put a airway appropriate either oral or nasopharyngeal airway and we can utilize the help of the other person the second person to give some extra pressure over the circuit so that adequate seal is obtained so to conclude for the mask ventilation the tips is whenever the, if you suspect a difficult mask ventilation follow these principles that is ramp position or ventilator drilling or laryngoscopy position that position is very important not only going to help for intubation but also for mask ventilation and it is going to buy more time for you for the patient to get desaturated second possible check for mask seal before induction itself so uh, don't try to um, choose the mask after induction so it is going to be a big disastrous if you are going to encounter some problem then adequate pre oxygenation irrespective of the patient's adequate pre oxygenation and do all measures to increase the amount of oxygen reserve in the patient like uh, mask and pre oxygenating the patient with cpap ventilator ventilator laryngoscopy patient if possible additional source of oxygen supplementation through catheter during mask ventilation or induction all those things are very important then choose appropriate size airway for the patient that has to be prepared pre induction itself then the need of adequate help and backup plan is very important for successful management now moving on to the most important uh, thing which we do in our day to day daily uh, anesthesia practice that is uh, the endotracheal tube first let us see the cortex commonly used cortex endotracheal tube so remember when you are in exam in viva this is if you are going to take endotracheal tube if you don't tell each and every part it will be a disaster so Uh, try to find out what are the parts available what are each and everything written in the endotracheal tube has to be answered and not only for exam but is also very important for our practice so this is the picture of the endotracheal tube you can see the patient end and the machine end and you can see the bevel murphy sai cuff vocal cord guide and other markings which are all there and the patient in the in the machine end you have the uh, universal adapter so let us see a small video of uh, the anatomy of this endotracheal tube so here you can see the cortex endotracheal tube so uh, from uh, the patient end to machine end vitreous we are having the following structures that is the first one is the bevel so first thing why there is a bevel instead of bevel if you have a cylindrical cut tube what are the problems so the bevel is very important for two things because the cylindrical tube will face some difficulty when we intubate for entering into the narrow vocal cord that's why the bevel is there since it is a tapered edge it is going to help us for easy facilitation of the intubation the second thing is the bevel if the bevel because of the bevel the see usually in the portex nor all normal uh, conventional uh, portex tubes the bevel will be facing on the left side so whenever we are intubating the purpose of intubation uh, the principle behind intubation is we are going to put laryngoscope push the tongue towards the left side to create adequate space to visualize the vocal cord and we have to hold the tube in such a way that you are holding the tube in the distal third remember the tube is 
preformed little curvature is there. That curvature is called as radius of curvature. Usually it is somewhere around 140 millimeter plus or minus 20 millimeter. So why there is radius of curvature? This radius of curvature is very important because the, when, we are when, when we are intimating with a straight tube or if you are holding the tube with middle curve or the proximal on third, the, our own hand is going to hide our view. So it is very important, even though we have a lot of measures to check the tube is inside the trachea, the most important thing is you are supposed to see the vocal cord and you are supposed to see the tube is entering into the vocal cord. So the curvature and the bevel is going to aid us in visualizing the passage of tube. That's why the bevel, there is a bevel. So we have to utilize all these things. So remember when you are intubating, hold the tube in the distal third of the endotracheal tube. And once we are very close to the vocal cord, you are supposed to rotate it and you have to push it inside and you have to see the tracheal tube is passing inside the vocal cord. Next, you can see the Murphy side. It is very close to the bevel. See, Murphy side, this, whenever the tube is having Murphy side, it is called as Murphy's tube. And there is when there is no Murphy side, it is called as Megill's tube. So what is the purpose of this Murphy side? See, the Murphy, Murphy side is one additional source of ventilation. So if some, in case some mucus plug is getting occluded, they get occluded, attached to and occluded to the tip of the endotracheal tube, this Murphy side can be utilized for additional ventilation. Followed by this Murphy side, we have the most important part of the endotracheal tube, that is the cuff. So there are a lot of discussions and uh, theory behind the cuff. Initially, we were using red rubber tube when you were during our early anesthesia practice, which is a high pressure, low volume cuff. So what are the ones? See, the main purpose of cuff in an tube is it is going to provide adequate seal so that there is less chance of aspiration of the regurgitated contents. So the main purpose is for preventing aspiration. The other additional uses are to provide adequate positive pressure ventilation, to avoid leak so that adequate seal of ventilation is achieved, that was, and to avoid Airway uh, the theater contamination. If there is leak, it is going to produce contamination of whatever gases we use also. So nowadays, whatever available cuff, the cuff are high volume, low pressure cuff. So in next successive slides, I will enumerate few things about the cuff and its uh, under pressure it has to exert. So moving on to the other thing. So other than the cuff, you can see there is a marking. This marking is very important because for whenever you are intubating a patient. Try to maintain this mark at the level of vocal cord so that the margin of safety, that is the amount of tube below the level of vocal cord and uh, above the level of carina. So when it is too inside, it is going to provide endobranchial intubation and there is there, there are some problems for during ventilation. But it need not be correct in all patients. The ideal thing is you are supposed to ventilate and auscultate in both sides to check for bilateral air entry. That is the best thing. But it can be used as a guide for in few cases so that Initially, we can keep at this place, then we can check for ventilation and find out the, whether it is adequately placed or not. Moving on to other markings, you can see here the internal diameter of the endotracheal tube. So even though the hole of the tube along the outer diameter is important, since the manufacturers have various thickness, we produce the tube with various thickness, the outer diameter of a tube may not be equal for various manufacturers for the particular internal diameter. That's why we are always denoting or, not, or uh, denoting the tube with the internal diameter. So it is both the internal diameter and outer diameter are important. Whenever in tricky cases, especially in pediatric cases, you are supposed to watch for the internal diameter as well as outer diameter. Uh, so, so that we will not be land up in trouble of putting a tight endotracheal tube in pediatric patients. Followed by there is a mark that is the manufacturer. This is the manufacturer's name. And other things are, you can see a few markings that is 21, 20, 19, 20, 21, 22. These are all markings in centimeter from the tip of the endotracheal tube. Why do we need this marking? That is, when we are going to intubate a patient, we are we are supposed to fix at particular level because there are some chances that tube might move inside or accidental extubation possibilities are there, especially in cases where there is a lot of movement of the patient, head and neck surgeries, all those things. So in such cases, so it is very important for us after intubation, after by confirming bilateral air entry, we are supposed to check these markings at the level of immovable structure, not at the level of lip. See, whenever fix uh, at the level of lip and uh, there is if even smile one to two millimeter of movement is not going to tell us because the tube might move because of the soft, the, the, the lip also will uh, move through along the tube. So we are supposed to check at the level of incisor or in needle patient at the level of alveolus so that the movement can be easily notified. Then we have the uh, inflation tube for the pilot balloon followed by pilot balloon and Universal connector. 
Now, why do we call this as inverter connector? Because this is the part of the tube connector which is going to connect with the circuit. So, no matter whatever be the size of the electrical tube, this part is going to be different for according to the size of the electrical tube. But at the same time, this part which is going to connect to the circuit is of similar diameter. That is 15 millimeter diameter. So, that's why it is called as universal connector. For example, if you take a three size electrical tube or four size electrical tube, this part is going to be same. Whereas, this might change. That's why it is called as universal diameter. Coming to the uh, last part of the endotracheal tube, that is the pilot balloon. In the pilot balloon, this is one part, and on this part is going to be stay outside the patient. So, in the pilot balloon, there will be something called as uh, the inter. They, they have noted the internal diameter of the tube, and it is a spring loaded valve is there, so it can allow air to pass through one side, not to the other side. The other important thing which you can see is you can see some circle with a mark, and it has written as thirty. So, that is one of the very important part which will be asked in exam sometimes. Because that is called as the resting diameter, cuff resting diameter. So, what is the importance of this cuff resting diameter? So, whenever the cuff resting diameter is more than 25 or 30, it is going to tell that the cuff resting diameter is nothing but after equilibration, after inflation in a patient, once it is get equilibrated with the temperature of the patient, it is going to occupy certain diameter. The, um, uh, the diameter, it is uh, with the diameter, we will know how much pressure it is going to exert along the walls of the trachea. So, the cuff resting diameter is very important. When the volume of cuff resting diameter is more, it is going to tell us it is going to provide less pressure for the volume. So, the tracheal cell mucosal injury can be reduced. That is the purpose of this cuff resting diameter. So, previously used retrobert tube has a very low cuff resting diameter. So, this will apply more pressure on one particular point, whereas this type of tube will apply uniform pressure over a wider area of the tracheal tube. Now, uh, let us uh, see for a few practical points. Like, this is the proper operate way of intubating a patient. So, you are know, holding the laryngoscope with the left hand. You are supposed to utilize the radius of curvature while intubation. See, when we intubate like this, holding the tube in the middle third and you are, uh, this while, while intubating, you are, whenever there is less space, your own hand is going to hinder your view. So, you are supposed to intubate in a manner that you have to hold the tube in the distal third, you have to manipulate in such a way until the tube is passed inside the vocal cord, carina, sorry, inside the vocal cord, you are supposed to see and check it is being intubated properly into the trachea. Again, important thing, as I said earlier, so you can see when the bevel is there, you will be able to see it is passing into the vocal. That's why the purpose of bevel is for easy passage and as well as the uh, uh, visualization during intubation. Now moving on to the cuff, as I said earlier, there are two types of cuff. Previously, we were using uh, high pressure, low volume cuff. In this situation, the contact of the contact of this cuff with the trachea is at one point, this point. So it is going to apply more pressure over the tracheal mucosa. Whenever the tracheal, the cuff pressure, the pressure exerted by the uh, endotracheal cuff is going to be higher than the mucosal pressure of the trachea, it is going to obstruct the blood supply. That's why nowadays we are using is high volume low pressure cuff. This is one important, very good study which was published in British Journal in 1985 itself, where there is a tabular column between the, there, there is a graphical representation between the relationship between endotracheal cuff pressure and mucosal perfusion. Here you can see when there is no pressure because of endotracheal tube, the perfusion of the tracheal capillary mucosa is 100%. As the pressure uh, keep on increasing, the mucosal perfusion starts decreasing. So this is the ideal pressure that is 20 to 30 millimeter of 30 centimeters of water where there is little compromise of the tracheal mucosal blood supply. As we keep on increasing, you can see when the pressure is 30, there is a slight pale mucosa visible pulsatile arteries, but at the at more than 40 million 40 centimeter of water in a tracheal tube cup pressure, the mucosal perfusion almost becomes zero. So at one point of time, when the pressure exceeds 40, 50, it's going to compromise the entire blood supply of the tracheal mucosa and if it is going to stay there for longer time, it is going to create long term complications like uh, tracheal stenosis. So the last one more important uh, practical point is this endotracheal tube can be used for both uh, for uh, nasal as well as oral intubation. So remember when you are intubating nasally, your aim is not to injure turbinates. We are worried about turbinates, not about septum. When you injure the turbinate with sharper edge of the endotracheal tube, you are going to catch hold of some of the turbinate into the tube. And when we ventilate in successive ventilation, it is going to push the soft tissue into the bronchus. So the very important thing is when you are introducing the endotracheal tube through right nostril, make sure the bevel faces the 
terminate so that the sharp end of the tube is facing towards the septum so that we are not injuring so you have to reverse it for the left side so uh, aim is not to injure the terminates coming to the position this is the radiological see you, 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 when you see the endotracheal tube there will be a blue line running along the whole course of the endotracheal tube that is for uh, for uh, visualization in the radiography so this is here you can see the chest x-ray patient where you can see the line so the ideal position is you are supposed to keep the tracheal tube in adult patient for four, three to three to five centimeter above the level of carina that is you should place it ideally at the three 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 or t4 portable body so now coming to the other type of tube reinforced tube this is one of the very peculiar tube where there is complete wire reinforcement of the entire tube so why there is a need for the reinforced tube so there are some situations where we use the endotracheal tube for head and neck surgeries where there will be a lot of manipulations in thyroid surgeries whenever they are there manipulating the tube might twist or kink in such situations what happens is it is going to create obstruction or the resistance is going to increase to avoid that what they want to do is uh, they have divided this uh, armored endotracheal tube where the tube walls are embedded with spiral metal wires so this is going to offer little bit of resistance for the kinking so since there is uh, wire reinforced there is no need for radio opaque line so most of this tube does not contain radio opaque line the other two important difference are you definitely need a stillet because this is not uh, this is so flexible without stillet you will not be able to intubate you uh, are using doing conventional laryngoscopy the second important difference is you are supposed to know is in portex portex tube the universal connector can be removed whereas in this flexometal tube it will be fixed so suppose you are intubating in a omfs patient where uh, we are going to fix a submental fixation the most important point is you are supposed to remove the universal connector from the tube earlier because it is completely fixed you have to use uh, mosquito or uh, other uh, forceps to remove it first and then you have to reinsert otherwise you have to redo the entire procedure so here you can see the endotracheal tube is completely wire reinforced i'm going to just enumerate what are the salient differences instead of uh, one mark it consists of two marks so that uh, you can place the endotracheal tube between the two marks and uh, the most important thing is you can see see the normal tube when it gets folded or kinked you can see there is a uh, reduction in the diameter it is uh, it increases resistance whereas in the flexometallic tube no matter how much uh, kink is there the entire lumen is totally maintained so the flow of air will be sufficient and there won't be any obstruction similarly so these are all two places these are all one place where there is no wire reinforcement so in the, along the entire course of the tube at the level of connector and at the level of tip below the morphis i there won't be wire reinforcement so those are all the two places where there is chance for kinking as i said uh, these are kink resistance but these are all not highly mechanically uh, not uh, resistant so this are this is one situation where a patient um, flexometallic was tube was used and the patient had bitten the tube so you can see this since these metal wires to uh, can offer some resistance muscle is the strongest muscle in the body so when the patient recover from anesthesia they might bite the tube in case if it happens it could produces complete occlusion it will not regain its position original position so it produces complete occlusion so remember the most important point is whenever you are using a flexometallic tube for patient you are supposed to put a bite block or airway that is very mandatory so now coming to the other uh, important invention which i feel it's a micro cuff tube so previously uh, up to 8 years of age we try to avoid cuff endotracheal tubes in pediatric patients but the reason being that is we all know as of now the subcricoid region is the narrow spot in the pediatric airway so when we are putting a tube and inflating with the cuff so when the cuff pressure is going to high be high it is going to provide some sort of injury and edema in the subcricoid region since being it is very narrow when the edema is there it is going to increase turbulence for the flow which in case increase the resistance whenever there is a decrease in radius it increases the resistance by 32 times that is twice that for adult so being a narrow airway when we put cuff and inflate the chance of post extubation croup is very high in pediatric patients that's why we have devised this micro cuff tube so the important part is compared to the normal cuff which has a cuff of 50 to 70 micrometer this micro cuff tube is cuff uh, the, uh, the 
polyurethane foil is only 10 micrometer and it usually forms a uniform enlargement instead of a short uh, contact it forms a uniform cylindrical enlargement that is a very important thing the second important thing is the cuff is very short and it is very placed distally to the uh, tip of the tube and they have not uh, placed a uh, uh, muffy in this tube so what is the advantage of this let me see through this video see you can see this is a micro cup tube so the most important part is here you can see the marking for uh, uh, this is the marking where when we are intubating we are supposed to keep it at low focal cut here you can see instead of here this is the portion this is the portion of the endotracheal tube going to be placed in the subcracate region which is the narrowest part when there is a cuff at this place it is going to create problem whereas in this situation the cuff is distally placed and the cuff is small short so it is not going to produce any damage when there is uh, inflation so this is a comparison between the three tubes this is the uncuffed tube this is a normal cortex cuffed tube this is the cuffed uh, micro cuff tube so here you can see this is the point we are going to place the tube in such a way the vocal cord is retained so in a normal tube just below the level of vocal cord the cuff is there and the inflation of this creates a edema at the level of subcracate narrowest part whereas when we use this micro cuff tube here you can see it is placed very distally, no Murphy side. And see, you can see the enlargement of the tube also. This micro cuff tube, it's elliptical enlargement, in which in case the, uh, the contact point for the cuff with the trachea, trachea is here. So it is going to exert more pressure at one point. Whereas here, it's a uniform cylindrical enlargement. So it is going to produce, the, when the same pressure is applied over a wide area, the force is going to be very less. This is the physics behind this. So distal placed the short cuff is going to provide advantage. So again, and also this micro cuff is going to form a uniform, very thin contact with the uh, tracheal mucosa. That is also one reason the chance of reintubation. The study shows that the chance of reintubation very, very low with micro cuff tube and also the post extubation group. So uh, remember again, uh, when you are using nitrous oxide uh, in pediatric patients, when you are using cuffed endotracheal tube, irrespective whether it is micro cuff or normal tube, we are supposed to monitor cuff pressure periodically. So this is the picture, uh, so you can see the normal tube, the length of the cuff and the distance below the level of uh, vocal cord, how where the cuff is placed. Whereas here, this is the level of vocal cord and this is the length of the tube. So the subcracate part is going to be free. There is no cuff at the level of subcracate part. So moving on to next important uh, tube is ray tube. So there are two types of ray tube. Ray tube is nothing but ring adair elven tube under the name of uh, three persons who invented this tube. There are two types of ray tube, north facing that is nasal and south facing uh, oral tube. So uh, why there is a need for ray tube? This ray tube comes under the category of preformed tubes. Remember, suppose when uh, these ray tubes are invented for, uh, for a purpose because suppose consider a surgeon is doing a cleft lip surgery where you are supposed to identify the symmetry of the lips on both sides. If you are fixing the normal tube and you are fixing a normal tube at angle of mouth, it is going to alter the symmetry. So during surgery, the plastic surgeon will not be able to identify which is correct. So simultaneously, if you use the normal tube and fix it at the midline, so the need for fixing at midline occurs. And when the and normal retrograde tube is fixed at the midline, it is going to produce a compression. So when it is getting compressed, it is going to have increased resistance and there is a problem of inadequate ventilation. To avoid this, this ray tube has been designed. So it is a preformed curvature. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the normal tube, when it is uh, fixed or curved like this, it is going to reduce the uh, uh, reduce the air airway tube and it is going to increase compression and resistance. At the same time, this ray tube, since it is preformed, it is not going to provide any amount of resistance in the entire course of ventilation. So the second important thing, the most important thing when you use ray tube is the size. So we cannot follow the normal measurement because the portion, the preformed portion is fixed. So you are supposed to fix, when you are using this oral ray, you are supposed to fix this at the level of incisors and it will be over the momentum. Then you are, so the airway need not be same. The length of airway need not be same for the, any, for the same for a particular patient. So it might vary. So for some patients, the same eight size tube for some adult patient, it might be too long. For or some adult patient, it might be too short. So 
This is the way we are supposed to fix the oral relative. See, the curved portion where the marking is there, it has to be fixed at the level of momentum. For a nasal tube, it should be fixed like this. Suppose we get a situation like this, like the tube is inside and bilateral end is there, but it is too long. So the most of the part is uh, facing uh, coming outside, so you will not be able to fix appropriately. So you are supposed to put a smaller size tube. Remember, the patient uh, airway is too. So remember, the patient airway is too long. So here you can see most of the curved part is inside there and the So you are supposed to go for higher level of tray tube. This is one of the biggest disadvantage of tray tube. The other disadvantage is since there is a curvature, preformed curvature, suctioning is going to be different, difficult. Placement of stillness is going to be difficult. And when we are ventilating a patient, at the end of the procedure, the patient is breathing spontaneously. It is going to increase resistance and increase work of breathing. So coming to the double lumen tube. So uh, this is not a mandatory to know, but uh, I'm going to enumerate a few points about Robert Shaw type of double lumen tube, which is commonly available tube. It is available in two, so two different forms, that is right and left side. So now let us see. See, th this double lumen tube consists of uh, two tubes which is sandwiched to form a single tube. And you have two channels. One is tracheal channel. The second thing is bronchial channel. Here you can see two cuffs in this tube. One is blue color bronchial cuff, which is the peculiar, the peculiar of this is, this is a high pressure, low volume cuff. You are supposed to put uh, 1.5 to 2 ml. When you are inflating with more ml, it is going to produce damage. Bronchial rupture can occur. The second thing is the tracheal cuff. This is like the usual cuff. It is going to be placed above the level of carina and you can put around 8 to 10 ml of air. So this is the routine uh, high volume, low pressure cuff. You can see two opening. One is in the tip. This is going to open at the, in, the, in the level of bronchus and this is going to open at the level of trachea. So other than this, you have the similar number of markings. That is 37. This is a 37 French uh, left-sided uh, Robert Shaw type of double lumen tube where you can have the markings for fixation at the level of incisors. And it is, uh, see, they have differentiated that for differentiation purpose, the entire bronchial channel is blue color. You can see the blue color here. You can see the blue color pilot balloon. You can see the blue color cuff. And you can see in some, some manufacturers, this itself is blue color so that we can easily differentiate. Why it is being designed like this is because, see, whenever you are intubating uh, the double lumen tube, even though there are conventional methods of checking, the most confirmatory method is you are supposed to use a, a fiber optic bronchoscope and exit out through the tracheal lumen while ventilating the patient. Through the tracheal lumen when you exit out, you are supposed to see the blue color cuff entering into the bronchus. This is the best way for appropriate position of the endotracheal tube. For that, to for easy identification, they have designed it as a color coded endotracheal tube. So, uh, how to differentiate? The common question which will be asked is how to differentiate whether it is a left side or a left, the right side of the double lumen tube. Even though it is mentioned in the in the double lumen tube, you are supposed to uh, identify it by two, two types. So, when you hold the tube in the hand, you are supposed to hold in such a way the concavity is facing upwards. When the concavity is facing upwards, the tip of the tube will project towards one direction. If it is directing towards left side, it is left sided. The second thing, if it direct towards right side, it is right sided. The second thing is, you are supposed to closely monitor the bronchial cuff. So if you see the bronchial cuff, this is this cuff is unique and it does not have any hole. In case of right side double lumen tube, this cuff itself will contain a, a hole and the cuff will be donut shaped. When you inflate the cuff, it will be donut shaped because of the hole. The hole is for ventilating the upper lobe right side bronchus. So we all know most of the time we use left side double lumen tube. Even we are going, going to ventilate right lung, we are supposed to use double lumen tube because of one word that is margin of safety. The margin of safety is what it indicates is the amount of uh, tracheal tube below the level of vocal cord at the same time, the amount of bronchial tube is appropriate place so that adequate ventilation of all the lobes of uh, the lung is ventilated. That means there is a difference between branching for the right and left lobe. For the left, in considering the left lung, the upper lobe bronchus takes off at 5 cm, whereas in the right side, it takes off at very short distance, that is 2.5 cm. So when you don't place the right side double lumen tube properly, there is chance for obstruction of the right upper lobe bronchus. Whereas in left side, since the margin of safety is very high, that is a 5 cm, the chance of obstructing the upper lobe bronchus is very, very less. That's why, unless for specific, specific peculiar indication, we will always prefer 
right side and double uh, left side and double element two. Sorry. Height size selection it is always based on the height. The what does it indicate is based on the height there is a relationship between the bronchial diameter, especially in male patients. For every 25 year of age, the they are, they are, uh, the study says that it is increasing in size, enlarging in size. And for male patients, you always select if the height is more than 160 centimeter, it's 39. More than 170 centimeters, 41 size French tube, less than 160, 37. Whereas in female, we always prefer 35 or 37 based on the height, whether it is less than 160 or more than 160. The other thing is that, uh, the depth is always uh, there is a difference, but it is not of much importance because we are going to identify whether all the lungs are separated, then we can fix like that. So coming to for completion sake, uh, the one more important tube which we forget nowadays is combi tube. Because uh, nowadays in difficult airway society and the algorithm itself, the combi tube has been removed. But uh, to my knowledge, it's one of the very valuable device can save a patient at times because this tube is unique. It consists of a two separate channels. You can see here, there are two separate channels. This one channel is for uh, blue color channel with blue pile for, uh, for one. Uh, this is uh, being between the two cuffs. The other channel is below the cuff in the tip. tip. So what happens is, so when there is a CVC situations, we need not uh, look for any other things. We just we can open the mouth and we can put the computer inside. So that can go into either into esophagus or trachea. So what we are going to do is after after insertion, we are going to inflate this pilot balloon with 8 to 10 ml of air and this with 85 ml of air. So this is going to be in the pharynx, oropharynx or nasopharynx. It is going to produce a seal and this might be inside the trachea or esophagus. So we are going to ventilate this first. When it is in the trachea, we will be able to ventilate and we can ventilate this through this lumen. When this is in esophagus, what we are going to do is we are going to ventilate through the other lumen. You can see this is the closer picture where you can see multiple four to eight openings are there. So this two provides adequate seal. Suppose if it is inside the esophagus, this closes the upper esophageal splinter and this closes the nasopharynx. So whatever we are coming through this will enter into the trachea. So this is also a very valuable device in difficult airway management. So coming to the other important thing is airway. Airways, we have oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airways. To my knowledge, again, next to mask, this is the most important device. The aim of the device is to lift the tongue and epiglottis away from the posterior pharyngeal wall so that the upper airway obstruction is avoided. So, coming to the part of oropharyngeal airway, this is the picture of oropharyngeal airway where you can see the flange, this is the body, or this is the channel. So, it is, it is a hollow tube which is curved according to the anatomy of the patient's airway. So, if it is ideally placed, it is going to create a channel so that the tongue and the posterior pharyngeal wall is separated and if there is an easy passage of air will be there. So these are all the available faces. Commonly, we use this green color that is size two airway for adult male and female. Whenever the whenever you, the, you, you think the airway might be uh, long, you can use higher sizes. Most important thing as I said earlier is the appropriate size of airway. When we choose a airway very small, it is not going to solve the purpose. At the same time, when you don't, when you choose airway of uh, bigger length, it is going to provide itself with an obstruction because it may push the epiglottis into the vocal cord over the glottis. So there is obstruction. So the ideal way of checking is, is you are going to place it at the level of the flange, at the level of incision. The tip of the airway should be at the level of mandible. These are all some of the examples of intubating airways. Because suppose in case you are using fiber optic bronchoscope and you are cho choosing a oral intubation, uh, there is every chance for the patient to bite the fiber optic bronchoscope. So these are all the available intubating airways that is Berman airway, Louis Sapien airway, Williams airway and Patel Siracus airway. Of this uh, Berman airway, this one peculiar thing is you can retain the airway itself after intubation itself with the tube in place. This is channel for tube to run. The other airways we are supposed to remove by some means. So these are all the available intubating airways. Coming to the natural pharyngeal airway, the one biggest advantage is Compared to oral airway, this is going to provide less, less stimulus of uh, reflex. So the uh, tolerability of a semi-conscious patient for this airway is going to be high. Again, the appropriate uh, size is, is we are going to place it at the level of the flange, should be at the level of nostril, so that the tip of the uh, airway should be uh, just be, be before the tragus. So these are all the examples. And this is one of the unique ones which is where there is adjustable uh, flange. So if it is of little big length also, we can just adjust it 
pre-operatively pre, pre we have to mark it and we can place it and we can fix the flange at that level so that there is uh, less chance of uh, misplacement. Coming to the other uh, adjuvant devices for uh, difficult area management, that is, this is endotracheal tube inter introducer, commonly called as Bougie. So these are all the commercially available types of Bougie, gum elastic Bougie, Frova, Cook Medical Airways and the uh, other intubating introducers. Uh, uh, in pre-video laryngoscopic era, it is one of the common devices which we always have in our uh, hands. Uh, so it is one of the very important devices which is going to help us in management of difficult airway. Uh, the tube length is will be usually of 60 to 70 centimeters. The most important part of this is the distal tip. This tip is called as Cody tip because there is an angulation of the distal tip. So here you can see in this picture. The distal tip is slightly angulated for 30 to 45 degrees. So the importance is when you are intubating with the bougie, ideally you are supposed to have an additional source of person for railroading the endotracheal tube over the bougie by selling a technique. So what you are supposed to do is you are supposed to introduce the laryngoscope, then introduce the bougie. Sometimes you can railroad into the tube already or you can introduce the tube bougie first. So this is very useful in situations like Carmack Lagan 3 where you are able to see only the tip of the epiglottis or in Carmack Lagan 4 grades where you are not able to see any, any epiglottis at all. So what you are going to do is very close to the laryngoscopy blade, you are going to advance the bougie. Because of the anterior direction, it might go anteriorly. So you can't do much manipulation, but once it goes anteriorly, it can enter. If it enters into the trachea, you might get a gritty feel because of the placement of uh, uh, cartilages in the anterior part of the trachea. That's why you are supposed to orient in such a way that Cody tip is anteriorly placed while you are intubating. So you get a gritty feel. The second thing is you can introduce to some extent to 35 to 40 centimeter and there will be some sort of resistance after some point. When you feel resistant at 35 centimeter, it means that it is going into either one of the bronchus. That's why you are feeling the resistance because of the cartilage rings. Whereas in case if you enter into the esophagus, it is being a hollow structure and a soft structure. It is not going to provide any amount of resistance and it will go entirely even after 40 centimeters. When it is going beyond 40 centimeters and you are not able to feel resistance, remember you are entering to the esophagus. The other last thing which I am going to tell is endotracheal tube introducer. Uh, so now in the uh, video laryngoscopy era, I personally feel uh, bougies are, are not so important because uh, this hyperangulated blades, hyper, when you are using hyperangulated blades, it is very difficult to manipulate the bougie to enter into the, into the vocal cords because we are not going to do the neck movements to align the axis. So hyperangulated blades means uh, bougie will be of difficult choice. So we are preferring stillets. The, stillet, the peculiarity of the stillet is the tip is very soft. Inside it contains a metal, a small metal rod, but in the tip of the bougie is going to be short to prevent trauma. So this is the ideal placement of stillet for a endotracheal tube. Depending on the patient, if uh, if you feel the hyperangulation is needed, you can uh, you can bend some more. So the ideal position is like this: you are supposed to introduce the uh, stillet. The tip of the stillet should be at the level of the bevel and it should be like a hockey shape. The last thing I'm going to tell is one of the very valuable devices, uh, entry uh, airway exchanges. So uh, these are all very important uh, devices uh, compared to even sometimes we can use uh, this bougies for replacement, but the peculiarity of the device is it is of wider diameter and it is a hollow tube. You can see multiple openings. So when you are not able to reintubate, you can ventilate through this. So that is one of the biggest advantage. The second advantage is the diameter of the entry. See, remember a situation like you are intubating through fiber optic bronchoscope or intubating through a, a, a supraglide devices, devices where it is a conduit. So when you intubate over a fiber optic bronchoscope, suppose you are intubating adult patient with 4.5 mm fiber optic bronchoscope and you are using 7 mm inter internal diameter tube. The space between the outer sheath of the fiber optic bronchoscope and the internal diameter the tube is going to be very high. So especially at the level of vocal cord, it is going to create a trouble because a lot of soft tissues like arytenoids get caught in between the tube and the bronchoscope. So there is high chance that the tube might not be able to pass inside with ease. But at the same time, if you are going to use entry catheter, it is going to provide a good diameter and you are going to railroad endotracheal tube. The space between the uh, entry catheter and endotracheal tube is going to be very less and there is no much play or space for play. So we can easily railroad the tube without much difficulty. 
at the same time it can be used for exchange of tubes like suppose we didn't plan for uh, ic ventilation for a omfs procedure we have intubated with a uh, ra tube or flexible tube tube those are not good choice for post operative ventilation in such situations where the chance when we extubate and reintubate the chance of uh, failed intubation is high we can use this wonderful device so with this uh, we come to the conclusion so my take home point is uh, uh whatever be the available gadgets please understand the physics behind that so that uh, the each and every part of the tube if you know understand why it is devised you can maximum you can have a maximum utilization of this device so uh, in some more uh, since uh, we don't have much time it's, uh, we have not discussed about laryngoscopy and fibrotic bronchoscope but i hope i have enumerated few salient points thank you very much sir uh thank you dr sandeep can you hear me dr sandeep voice is low sir sir edward sir i am not able to hear whatever rajesh sir your voice is very low you are not yes, uh, able to hear anything sir actually okay i will yeah, yeah, sir, take yes, the questions sir 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 how to decide the pediatric tube size sir um, sir actually we commonly follow the formula of uh, whether the patient age is 6 uh, years or above so less than 6 years we use uh, the age by 3 plus 3.5 formula or uh, more than that age by 4 plus 4.5 formula and when there are multiple formulas sir personally what i feel is uh, i'll out of my experience i will have uh, based on formula i will decide the tube and i will try to make a tube uh, one one or uh, 0.5 above and 0.5 below so that uh, the chance of uh, reintubation is very less and nowadays since we have started using micro cup tube uh, it uh, the reintubation rate is definitely less so it's like an cup tube so and uh, in our institute we have used uh, in some study we did a study where we used to preoperative ultrasonography to measure the diameter of airway if uh, facilities are available the, that only is going to help us more with that study we came to a conclusion that uh, the chance of uh, reintubation is very very less so nowadays we are using cuff neutral tubes to avoid the discrepancy so uh, so the question sir from post graduate so it will be in the basic level yes, so uh, what is the difference between the regular and flexometal difference between sir between the regular tube and the flexometal yes, uh flexometal tube is actually uh, the basic difference is it is completely wire reinforced except at the level of uh, connector and the murphy side so this is uh, supposed to be kink kink resistant so whenever we are uh, using it for uh, head and neck surgeries where there is much manipulation of airway is going to be there to avoid the kink or risk to increase the resistance we are going to use this reinforced tube so the most important thing is when you are using flexometal tube unlike cortex tube you are not you, you should be uh, intubating with a stillet the stillet becomes mandatory so the same question is uh, what is the special points about the micro laryngeal tube Um, is it available in all sizes? Yes, sir. It's available. See, what I have seen is uh, it's available in uh, five, five point five, and six size tubes. So basically, uh, according to anesthesiologist, what we prefer is we prefer to put larger size tube. But uh, the surgeons usually always ask smaller, ask smaller size tube. So what we decide in our institute is we are we will uh, try to get a good uh, uh, orientation. That is, uh, we try to get a video laryngoscopy picture where the exactly where the lesion is located if it is in the anterior part of the if it is in the anterior part of vocal cord we try to put smaller size tube if it is in the posterior part we try to put larger size tube because that provides a lot of difference so since tube is going to lie on the anterior aspect uh, posterior size tube posterior side lesions uh, in such situations we will prefer a smaller size ml tube okay sir so how long the flexometal tube can be kept in the post operative period before changing to pvc tube sir ideally speaking uh, we should have a thorough discussion with the surgery team during the procedure so it's not recommended to keep it in the post operative bed ideally because it is definitely going to keep resist uh, increase resistance uh, literature i exactly don't know but in our institute uh, for one day if accidentally we place and uh, suddenly we are not able to intubate we will usually keep up for, for up to 24 to 48 hours okay sir thank you very much sir thank you thank you very much there sir. are other questions uh, available Uh, we can move to the, the second topic thank you thank you sir thank you sir so the second topic is supraglottic airways 
by Dr. Rav Kumar. So he is also an astro professor from SRMC, uh, Chennai, and uh, he is famous among the. So hope you can see my uh, screen. I'm and uh, I'm audible in Okay, okay, you are audible, sir. You can start your presentations. Yes, sir, you can uh, ah. see my screen, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's audio. We can see. Yeah. It's audible also. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. The topic given to me is superlytic airway device. I'm Dr. Ram Kumar. Uh, I'm a safe professor in SRMC Chennai. The objective of my talk is to cover the uh, uh, superlytic device in the following headings, like initially about the history and the classification and the important features in the uh, current uh, second generation devices. And we're going to revisit some of the old devices and the current new devices, so the important safety features and the common standard insertion techniques and uh, uh, device specific insertion techniques. And if that goes wrong, if there is a device failure, we'll find we'll see what are the rescue maneuvers to be done to have a very good ventilation. And finally, so we'll see some of the important advanced applications, not all. And, uh, and finally, the take-home points, which that is almost mandatory for your exam purpose as well as for your practice. To begin with, uh, the history, uh, the LM, superlight device, the LMA was the first one. This is a laryngeal mask airway. That's a trademark device. Uh, in exams, you can't use uh, laryngeal mask airway as a, a terminology because it's a trade name mark, uh, trademark uh, name given to, taken by the laryngeal mask company. So LMA was the first device uh, developed by, uh, it was developed by Dr. Rajiv Brain in 1981, but it practiced in 1988 in the UK and probably in 1991 in the US and flow on and further on, that's like we've got many other devices. So what Archie Brain has said that it's, it's an alternative device, uh, either between the endotracheal tube or the far face mass ventilation for both spontaneous and the passive pressure ventilation. Initially it was devised for a superficial surgeries or a rescue uh, um, ventilation. Then later on, it has gone to many other advanced applications. And uh, from then, we got uh, LMA ProSeal, LMA Supreme, uh, intubating laryngeal mask airway. Then you got many other devices. So how to classify uh, these devices and one entering? So far, there is no universally agreed nomenclature, definition, or a terminology, I mean, classification. The current terminology, which tends to relate with the superlytic airway devices, is a superlytic airway, that is superlytic airway devices, or a superlytic SGA, superlytic airways. Another terminology just linked the practices extraglottic airway devices or extraglottic airway airways. So see what is superlytic airway device. Superlytic device is a device which you commonly tend to use in a practice. All these devices have a mask with a ventilation orifice, which is present just above the glottis. Whereas extraglottic airways, so Sandal sir talked about the combi tubes and other easy tube. That devices have got an extension, the tube which is extending into the upper uh, I mean area as well. That is, the tube has got extension below the glottis. But the ventilation happens between the hypopharynx and the glottis. So this, all these devices are uh, termed under the thing called extraglottic airway devices. But what we are going to see is over the superlytic airway devices. So what is the current uh, classification, which is very practical or which is morally accepted is that uh, Tim Cook's classification. Before that, we had uh, classifications which is based upon the anatomical mechanis mechanistic uh, uh, facility of uh, each device. In, it was Miller would uh, is, he classified as an uh, cuffed perilangeal sealers, cuffed pharyngeal sealers, and cuffless anatomical pre-shaped sealers. Later on in 2012, when all this extraglottic airway comes into the play, that means this device does not violate into a uh, glottis, and uh, the ventilation airway is just in and around the bed glottic area. So it is classified as extraglottic airway device with an inflatable periglottic cuff, like an AMBU or uh, LMA mask airway or an extraglottic airways with no inflatable cuff like IGEL and SLIPA. And then other classifications, extraglottic airways with two inflatable cuffs like combi tube and uh, easy tube. And the other one is like extraglottic airways with single, single pharyngeal inflatable cuff like Cobra PLA. What the recent uh, classification, which is like again by Tim Cooper in 2009, he said that it's better to use it as a first generation device and a second generation device, which is more practical. And uh, that's why it is, it is called as a pragmatic classification. The first generation device are like are seen as a simple airway tubes, just for ventilation purposes used, but no other advantages. Whereas the second generation device has got the features to reduce the risk of pulmonary aspirations, so thereby uh, preventing a lot of complications. 
there are a number of fuzz change device uh, which are like slowly going out of the practice. Currently in Indian center, we tend to use LMA classic or LMA unique, AMBU, LMA just flip, LMA flexible or AMBU again. But the second generation device, where are like, we have got only few like LMA Pro Seal, LMA Supreme, uh, Laryngeal, I mean, uh, uh, LMA Protector, AMBU or again, or a Basca mask, or a RQ blocker. So let's see what are the generation device, why it is not like slowly going out of the um, practice. It is considered as a simple RV tube, just an RV tube with this, which has got a connector and the yeah, yeah, RV connector, which is a connector at the top, and a uh, mask, which is silicon or a, a PVC size mask in a uh, disposable type with an epiglottic aperture bar. This is epiglottic aperture bar, which is there to prevent epiglottic obstructing the ventilation. So this device has gotten poor uh, or a low oropharyngeal leak pressure. What is oropharyngeal leak pressure? It is a pressure uh, above which the ventilation, the, uh, the tube tends to leak. That means the gas, gas is going to, ventilating gas is going to escape into the esophagus, into stomach or escape upwards. That means there's going to be hypo uh, ventilation, displacement of device if you're trying to ventilate with the higher RA pressure. Say a patient with the obese or a laparoscopy surgery or an um, pregnant patient is going to displace backwards and upwards so it may cause hypoventilation and at same time can has got an aspiration risk. And apart from that, it has gotten cuff related injuries, uh, injuries as well. If you tend to inflate with higher cuff pressure, it has, can cause mucosal injuries. That's why uh, what I think is it's time to abandon this vintage laser mask and it's time to start using second generation devices. What is the advantage of this using a second generation device? The main purpose is better ventilation because all these devices got a better oropharyngeal leak pressure, which is around uh, 30 centimeters of water. And uh, at the same time, it has got drain tubes, so it, uh, it can aspirate the gastric contents and the seal, uh, the, the esophageal seal, that is the tip of the mask, which is which rests on the upper visible sphincter. It forms a bulk space here. It causes mechanical obstruction of gastric contents and the facility of gastric tube, which is going where you can pass and nasogastric tube and aspirate the gastric content, you can reduce the chance of uh, aspiration. And the mass seal, which is like double seal, a double cuff with a pro seal, or in a soft uh, gel-like cuff with an eye gel, or any other device which has got a very good uh, seal around the periglottic structure, that is called pharyngeal seal or a gas seal, that's a oropharyngeal uh, seal, uh, which gives, an, I mean, uh, hypopharyngeal seal, which gives a very good uh, ventilation. So this is the main advantage of uh, second generation device. That's why we, everyone suggests to use a second generation device. But currently, in recent times, there are like articles saying that Basca mask as a third generation device. Why it is uh, tend to like place it on third generation device? Because of the self energizing sealing mechanism. This has got a uh, silicon semi membranous cuff, which is open cuff, which tends to get a seal with an higher uh, oropharyngeal liquid or higher array pressure. I'll just demonstrate how this cuff works. See, when you tend to ventilate, you can observe here, the cuff tends to move anteriorly, that is like upwards. That means that as the airway pressure increases, the seal increases, the seal with an glottis or periglottic structure increases. Whereas with another uh, devices, when the airway pressure increases beyond their like 30 centimeter of water or appropriate for that particular device, there's a chance of leak. So here the vasca mask, as the airway pressure increases, seal increases. But what Tim proposed that, but uh, this advantage of Vasca uh, uh, mask is not like evident, proven by evidences. So there is still there's lack of evidence on this. So what he said this, the, the classification as first and second generation is retained and Vasca mask, mask still same uh, in the, right, same in the second generation device. And he suggested a couple of suffixes. He, uh, he said that a second generation device with a suffix of I is meant for a device search, which has got an intubation um, success rate more than 50%. And if the suffix D is used, that is for a direct intubation. If the suffix is G is used, that is for a guided intubation. Coming to what are the desired features of a supraoid device. When I choose a supraoid device, the two essential requir requirement of a device is to have a reliable ceiling without obstruction. And next is the important one, it should prevent aspiration. The preferential requirement is to access to the airway. That is, it can be used to uh, intubate or it can be used as a conduit to endotracheal intubation. Let's see what are the features which helps to uh, get this uh, features, uh, I mean, very useful. Coming to the design features, the drain tube, as I already said, drain tube is, with the drain tube, we can reduce the 
uh, risk of aspiration and reduce the risk of gastric inflammation. Uh, and next is the bite block. If the patient is like an indicated pain, it tends to they tend to bite the subglottic device, so they can go for an obstruction and they go for an hypoventilation or hypoxia. So the bite block, if it's a rigid material which is present at the upper end of the device, as shown here. This is a bite block here, and there's a bite block here, which is which is around the teeth area. They prevent the uh, occlusion of the scrot device when the patient is in inadequate plane. And there's a fix fixation tab with a LMA protector or a LMA supreme, which helps you to guide where the device is placed, whether it's placed appropriately or not. And with this tab, you can place the, uh, uh, I mean, the <coughs> plaster to secure the device in a proper position. And the availability of the reusable or a single use device, all these devices helps to get a better seal. Uh, this, whereas in the pro seal, it's got double cuff, which is silicon cuff, whereas this is a LMA fast stack, a disposable version of an ILMA. This, uh, these designs help us to get, uh, improve the efficacy of this device. And this efficacy is assessed based upon the insertion success rate. And the main part is the first atom success rate. If you are going, doing, plan to do a thesis or a study on a school device, the other important uh, parameter is, is to assess the success rate of the first atom. Uh, a device which has got a success rate more than 90%, that means that it's got a very good success rate. At the same time, it should cause any trauma. So the less trauma is also very important with the device. So that is also should be considered. And the important thing is the patency, how the RFH, RF patency is main, maintained and the ventilation parameter. The important parameter is to assess the oropharyngeal seal. That is, the you assess the oropharyngeal leak pressure that is done by the few per performance tests, which I'm going to show you later in the subsequent slides. It's a oropharyngeal leak pressure or a minute. Uh, <coughs> Uh, ventilation test. Another is how can you access to the airway. So that is the chance of intubation through a device. All these decides are helps to assess the efficacy of a particular blood device. Let's see what is oropharyngeal leak pressure. That is important because when doing a study or when you going to use a device for a obese patient or a laparoscopy surgery, we need to know the oropharyngeal leak pressure because you don't want a leak or hypoventilation in the middle of a surgery. What it is? It is to de design uh, and find out what is the OLP. Oropharyngeal leak pressure is to test is to determine the maximum airway pressure achievable before the gas leaks. Above which, if above the pressure, there is going to be impairment of ventilation, gastric insufflation, and aspiration. How it is tested? The definition is: this is how it's done. I'm I'm showing a assessment of oropharyngeal leak pressure in the middle of a laparoscopic surgery because if it's going to leak in the middle of a surgery, then it's going to be difficult to intubate or manage the patient. Here I'm using a pro seal. Three liters of flow is kept. I'm closing the APL wall to 30 centimeter of water and I'm going for a apneic period. That is some manual ventilation, leaving the system like that. So as the R three liters of gas flows, there's going to be a rise in pressure, uh, pressure which is going to having a upslope here. So at one point, it is going to reach the plateau. See, can you see the plateau at a 30 centimeter? If at one point it, it leaves the plateau or it's going to leak, when you hear audible leak or the, you achieve an equilibrium with the system that is at the 30 centimeter of water, that is called, that is the oropharyngeal leak pressure of the particular device. Here, the oropharyngeal leak pressure of this particular device as a pro seal is around 30 centimeter of water. This is how it tested, and that is, this is the way you should use it. This is a like definition kind that should be used in your practice or in your study. And uh, coming to other performance tests, the maximum minute ventilation test. This is to determine what is the actual maximum minute ventilation because if there's a leak or a slow explanatory flow that is going to affect this uh, maximum minute ventilation which is assessed for the, actually for the patient, how to do this test? You close the APL at 30 centimeter of water, then you what you do is like uh, uh, do a maximum ventilation, like increase the ventilation to, for um, uh, 15 seconds. And if you're able to see that maximum minute ventilation is greater than two liters per minute, that means that your uh, supraortic uh, function is, uh, so SGA functions very well. You have two tests to identify the ventilation parameter of a particular device. Coming to the safety aspect of a ventilation device, the important aspect is about aspiration protection. You what the risk aspiration with a supraortic device, the average is around 1,000, 1 to 4,000 to 1 to 12,000 in elective cases in comparison, comparison to a endotracheal tube, it is around 1 to 4,000. In emergency situations, the risk of aspiration is one in thousand in a, uh, with SGA, with endotracheal tube is one in nine hundred. The aspiration is like far less nowadays because of the features like drain tube, as already told, 
and the, the bulky tip which prevents mechanically uploads the upper esophageal sphincter so prevents uh, or like minimizes the respiration into the uh, risk of detestation to the throat and uh, the vasca mask has some in the posterior aspect which tends to collect the gastric contents and that is that can be aspirated through the drain tube which is present on either side of the ventilating tube which i going to show in later slides so next is like the traumatic placement if there is going to be a traumatic placement or a difficult insertion, there are going to be complications. The minor complication will be a sore throat if the device placed there for a longer period of the cuff is inflated and is more than 60 centimeters of water, chance of mucous injury is also high, the chance of dysphonia and dysphagia. And if it's going to be a difficult placement or a difficult uh, prolonged usage and the prolonged uh, high pressure cuff is there, then the chance of arytenoid uh, dislocation, tongue uh, enlargement and sinuses can occur and the chance of lingual recurrent lingual or hyperglossal nerve injury can occur. This thing should be kept in mind. So to prevent this, you have to choose an appropriate size uh, device for a particular age, particular gender, in, uh, and a particular weight of a patient, and use an appropriate techniques with uh, in a very good plane of anesthesia. And the position of device as well as the position of head and neck, is, uh, head and neck uh, position is also very important to avoid such injuries. And make sure if you're using a cuff device, Make sure the cuff pressure is less than 16 centimeter of water. And nowadays we've got a silicon based cuff and a soft gel like a thermoplastic glass or an eye gel. All this reduces the risk of uh, in mucosal injury, thereby future problems. And uh, try to avoid the prolonged use of soporic devices because that can easily end up in sore throat and mucosal injury. From now on, like we're going to see some of the important features, the safety features or unique features of the available common uh, devices in our part of. Uh, country, but the devices which you're going to see are ProSil, LMA Supreme, MyGel, Basca Mask, and Basca Best Mask, Ambora again, and ILMA and LMA Protector. So, this is the uh, ProSil. ProSil got two tubes. One is the airway tube, the, two, the anterior cuff. This is the anterior cuff. This is the posterior or the dorsal cuff. And uh, next is the drain tube, which is there, which runs in the posterior aspect of the, the posterior part of the bowl. That's the cuff bowl. And uh, ends up on the tip of the mask. This tube, which is there in the posterior part, acts, acts prevents the epiglottic obstruction, the epiglottic blocking the ventilation. It, it, it is almost equivalent to epiglottic aperture bar or a epiglottic uh, elevating bar in the other devices. The problem with the prosil is that it is, the cup is made up of silicon, which is very soft, which can cause backfolding or it can enter into the glottis if you insert uh, with, without beyond the maximum resistance. That can cause obstruction. Other thing is uh, the cuff can get distorted with the multiple use and can herniate and uh, can cause displacement while placing it. Because in reusable device, if you're trying to use more than 40 times and there's a chance of wear and tear, the mucus, I mean, cuff damage can occur. All this can lead to a uh, poor uh, fix, uh, poor ventilation and chance of uh, uh, dislocement, displacement is very high. The success rate with this device is around close to 90 percentage of the first attempt. But the, attempt, the success rate improves to 100% with the three atoms. And uh, with the bougie guided technique, even the first atom, uh, atom success rate is 100%. That's a pure, I mean, it's 100% uh, uh, correct placement. The overfilling the leak pressure for pro seal is around 27 to 31, which is like almost uh, highest of the common, uh, available uh, devices in our uh, kind of part. And uh, coming to LMA Supreme, LMA Supreme is like a combination of three devices. It is disposable like LMA Unique. It has got a rigid curved shaft like an intubating laryngeal uh, mask carve, that is ILMA, and this like a normal overpharyngeal curvature, so it doesn't require a sniffing portion to insert it. And it has got a gastric access, access as a prosil. So it combines features of a three other uh, uh, LMA devices. The uh, advantage is it has got a narrow mask, so easy to insert in a lesser small. It's normally required a two finger mouth, two centimeter mouth opening to insert a laryngeal mask carve. This, this has got a little advantage to place it. And it has got two lateral grooves on either side of the tube, which prevents tube, uh, airway tube kinking as well. The issues or limitations are here. It is made up of PVC. So there's more chance of trauma and compared to silicon devices. And the problem is the yeah, drain tube runs in the middle of a ventilation, vent, uh, airway lumen. So we cannot do, it's difficult to do a blind intubation. So what you can do is you can do a, a pediatric fibroid bronchoscopy and pass a guide and you would do a guided intubation if at all you want to intubate through a. LMA Supreme, and still the chance of cuff related complications can be there if you use for prolonged period for a high cuff pressure. The success rate is around 90% of the first attempt, and it's under percent around the third attempt. The leak pressure is around uh, 26 to 30 centimeter of water with LMA Supreme. 
me to other important devices or important innovation is IGEL. IGEL is like a preformed second generation device uh, invented by Mohammad Nazir, who is from UK, is a Pakistani. Uh, it is an excellent device because it has got it is a cuffless mask. It is made up of the gel and it has got an airway tube with a bite block in it and a airway tube with upper end cam connect. It is a 50 millimeter connector and bite block and the buckle cavity stabilizer. So this airway tube is not cylindrical with other LMA devices. It is an horizontally overed or elliptical in surface. So it fixes or stabilizes stuff in the oral and the throat uh, easily, and uh, the displays, chance of display, displacement is very less. And there is uh, a small projection in the cuff, which is called epiglottic rest, which prevents the epiglottis obstructing your ventilation. And uh, as I said, uh, the distal, uh, this is the tip of the device where the drain tube, the nasogastric tube comes through out of it, and the entrance is in the upper end on the right side of the ventilating lumen. The important feature is this mask, uh, this cuff, which is made up of a thermoplastic elastomer. The chemical name is styrene, ethylene, butadiene, and styrene. This has got, it's not like uniform in shape. It has got some elevations and depressions and notches, which is exactly the mirror image of this periglottic structure. So it fits very well as the, as it's inserted with the body temperature, it, it adapts to the, it, it like fits to the periglottic structure very well. So it gives very good uh, ventilation and very good uh, oropharyngeal elite pressure is very high. So uh, chance of displacement is very less and uh, very uh, chance of aspiration also radio, radio, uh, is less because of the availability of grain, grain tube. Uh, because of this material, they say that it's very stable in high altitudes and hyperbaric conditions. So this is the device which can be used in helicopter transfers as well. The success rate is close to 90% of the first attempt and it's 100% at uh, third attempt. The average leak pressure is around 26 to 30 centimeter of water. Basta mask and uh, Basta mask is an uh, uh, silicon device, it's a disposable silicon device, uh, still is considered a second generation device. The important aspect is the self energizing sealing mechanism, and the important the posterior aspect is the sump aspect, it is connected to the tip. So, all the gastric contents can be collected there and aspirated on either, uh, on the either side of the drain tubes. Drain tubes, the oropharyngeal leak pressure, what uh, it is flooded and, and it is the manufacturer's claims is around 40 center of water. Uh, the features here are it has got a tab which we are pulling the tab, it can be made into a preformed like an or of normal anatomical curvature like an ILMA. So it can be used uh, inserted without a, a sniffing portion. That is, if a patient has got a C spine fracture or a difficult neck, uh, neck uh, extension, then this, this can be used to insert it. So that's the advantage of this in uh, Vasca mask. And um, the, the mask is an open cuff system, it is a semi membranous silicon cuff which gives a very good sealing, as I already told, as the air pressure increases, the seal increases. And uh, really, that's a sump. This sump and the airway um, cavity is like uh, separated. They are not interconnected. And the sump is distally connected to the uh, tip. And next is the suction elbow on the drain tubes, which are there on either side of ventilating. But this is the ventilating lumen. You can see the ventilating lumen. On either side is a sump. And there's a suction elbow that can be attached to either side to attached to a direct wall mount suction. So you can have I, four, I, so, I mean, nine nitro pressure suctioning, uh, suctioning as well. As I said, this is the uh, sump, which is distally connected to the tip of the mask, which, which has got a projection which enters into the upper is because so it snugly fits into it. So the chance of uh, aspiration is like reduced. All the gas contents, which is there, uh, regurgitating should come into the sump, which can be drained on either side of the uh, ventilating lumen, there's a drain tube which can be aspirated. This is the blood which is collected. This I've used for a, a nasal surgery. So, the water, the blood which is coming from the nasal cavity is collected in the sump part and that is also open and is connected to the um, hypopharynx and that can be aspirated. And then, so the ventilation aspect is also good. The aspiration aspect is also very, very minimal, uh, very drastically reduced. This is called uh, Basca face mask. The difference here is it is a little shorter and the connector is a little bent. And uh, this can be used. I'll show the video how it can be used. Uh, there are a lot of studies. I mean, we need a lot of studies to prove the advantage of using this basket of face mask. Coming to Ambu again. Ambu again is almost similar to a LMA Supreme. It's a preformed, shaped uh, second generation device. The overall success rate is around 98 percentage. The leak pressure is around 22 to 34 millimeter of mercury. Uh, and uh, it can be used to, as a conduit to intubation. Uh, the said like it almost looks like an LMA Supreme. The difference here is the drain tube, which is side is present the side of uh, Ambar again, and the ventilating lumen is a little wide, so it can be used to intubate as well. And, and it got marks to 
uh, guide the uh, endotracheal tube uh, intubation as well as removal of the mask as well. Next, this is like an important exam question is like intubating laryngeal mask airway and ILMA. ILMA is like a reusable version. Uh, fast track is an uh, disposable version. Uh, it has got a uh, metal handle with a preformed rigid curved shaft, which is almost like 90 degree, which is similar to our oropharyngeal curvature. And it has got a silicone cuff, little bigger in shape. And this is the endotracheal tube. Uh, we have the endotracheal cuff is a little straight and the cuff is more distal and the cuff here is like an high pressure, low volume cuff. That means that you cannot retain the tube for longer periods. And uh, the, the tube is, the tip is like also soft silicone. It's like an uber tip. And, and there's a detachable connector with a cuff pallet balloon. And this is stabilizing rod. This is there to help you to remove the LMA cuff or the endotracheal tube after intubation. When an ILM is given as your exam question or like in a viva, the next important question is what is the maneuver? What is the Chandis maneuver? So Chandis maneuver is got two parts, part one and part two. Part one is to get an adequate seal, adequate ventilation. So if you're not able to get a seal, there's a leak, what you have to do is hold the handle, manipulate the handle in the horizontal and the sagittal planes. This is a sagittal movement and horizontal movement. So that at the same time, you got to start ventilating it with the cuff inflated position. When you start moving in the sagittal movement, a little horizontal, at one point, you'll get a very good ventilation with the least resistance or least tension in your uh, ventilating bag with a very good uh, rectangular uh, uh, trace in your NDTCO2. That means that that's the best place to place the device. And once it's placed, you should not change the the movement, you cannot move the device and that's a place, place to ventilate and that's the best position to intubate as well. So this is called Chandis Manor part one. What is Chandis Manor part two? Chandis Manor part two is, uh, is, is done during intubation. During uh, passing endotracheal tube, once the tube is like uh, inserted till the epileptic elevating bar, I think hope you'll understand what is like the epileptic elevating bar and particular point. So there's a black mark, there'll be a black mark in the uh, tube, it is uh, the 15 centimeter mark till that the portion is tube is inserted. That means the tube is just beyond the epileptic elevating bar. At, the, at, at this position, what you have to do is you have to lift the handle anteriorly, little anteriorly. That means you are taking, uh, you are aligning the laryngeal inlet with the ventilation, ventilating orifice of the device. So the tube goes directly into the uh, laryngeal inlet instead of going to eating uh, uh, the <coughs> epiglottis or into, into the esophagus. This is called Chandis Manor part two, that is lifting the handle anteriorly to uh, guide the intubation. What is the advantage of having ILMA? ILMA is that it can insert in the neutral position, so that can be used in a C-spine injury or a restricted neck movement patient. And it is a device of choice previously and still now, because you can, uh, if you're not able to intubate in an unanticipated, like a difficult intubation, you can insert that, you can uh, oxygenate the patient, and if required, you can use as a conduit to intubate the patient. The limitations are there are no periodic size available. It's size soluble in sizes three, four, five, and uh, it has got no protection against aspiration. So that's the issue. And it's a reusable device. Chance of infection is still high, and it's quite costly as well. It's around forty thousand baht. So the advantage of the uh, use of uh, ILMA. Now, now going to a recently uh, introduced device called LMA Protector. The advantage here is it's a single-use device which is soluble in silicon. It has got two drain tube, one is projected and one is there to pass on Riles tube. Uh, you can understand, you see here, one you can just do a, uh, attach a suction catheter and uh, do a suctioning. And uh, it has got a pilot, which is cup pilot technology. It has got color markings to indicate the pressure. It ideally should be in the, if cuff is inflated, it should be in the range of green color that is around uh, 40 to 60 centimeter of water. If it goes to red red area, that means it is it is gone. Barrier pressure, cuff pressure has gone beyond 70 centimeter. That means you have to deflate, especially when you start using nitrous oxide. You have to frequently assess this. That's the advantage of using this device, which has got a very good cuff pilot technology. Coming to after seeing all these devices, let's troubleshoot the problems. The common dilemmas of uh, using a supraorbital device is. The leak or hypoventilation, and next thing is an obstruction where this is like a not able to ventilate, there's an high air pressure is there. Uh, ventilation is like almost nil or reduced. The common uh, advice is to anywhere the problem, you're not able to ventilate. If there's a leak, the problem is the adequacy of plane. If the plane is inadequate, the vocal rod tends to move, it will not uh, allow us to ventilate properly, or it may end up in laryngospasm. 
other problem is the where pharyngeal muscles still can contract so they can displace the device uh, or the, away from the glottis and that's the issue with the uh, inserting a spola device in an inadequate pain so deepen the pain of anesthesia especially with the intravenous anesthetics make sure the cuff pressure is within 60 cm of what i if the cuff pressure is more than i it can the cuff can like uh, enlarge or swell and can cause displacement and if nothing works you remove and reinsert a next possible or higher or a smaller device or you can do maneuvers which i'm going to show now and if at all nothing works then you have to place it as a you can call it as a failed sga so what is the definition of a failed sga if you are not able to achieve a tidal volume of less than i mean if uh, six at least six times six ml per kg that is a tidal volume is around six ml per kg that is persistent and there's a progressive rise in etco2 and the spo2 is less than 90 percentage and uh, despite doing maneuvers and uh, size adjustments there is persistent leak or an upper air obstruction that means the device is fail that to switch out to other best possible device or an uh, switch out to endotracheal tube depends upon the necessity of the surgery or a uh, rest station coming to how will you know that this, this is uh, the device is failed you need to know what are the ways to test the correct placement uh important thing is when you able to pass an esophagus tube into the stomach and you can aspirate and that means that you are tip of the mask is in the upper isval sphincter that means that uh, the cuff i mean the uh, ventilation orifice of the cuff is in line with the uh, laryngeal inlet so that means that shows your placement is almost correct or you can perform a oropharyngeal leak pressure test which if that is which is up near to the uh, advice or a manufacturers like uh, a uh, number that means you can get a very good ventilation with the device so that shows that your placement is right if at all if you are available you have a fibrotic device and the patient requires an endotracheal intubation you can view the orifice view the placement of uh, vocal cord uh, by passing the fibrotic uh, scope through the airway channel and you can watch it is able to trace this are acoustic guidelines you can auscultate for ventilation for any wheezes or obstruction or laryngospasm I mean bronchospasms, and uh, next thing is uh, you can view the position of the external part of the device, whether whether there's a marking which is close to the incisor or away from the incisor. These are the guides to know whether the device is properly placed or not. There are a couple of tests uh, which is which is more regard to prosil, which can help you to know whether it's placed properly or not. This is called a suprasial nostrils or a gel displacement test, where you can make place a gel on the drain tube or a soap bubble, and what you have to do is. and look for this movement of gel this way slow movement like a minuscule when you press the suprasternal notch that means you are pressing the trachea that that in turn pressurizes or compresses the esophagus that is if the esophagus and the tip of the drain tube is in line the pressure is transmitted to the drain tube and that is felt as seen as a small movement if there is no movement that means the mask is too high or the cuff is folded back here the gel displacement test is done with the ventilation you just continue to ventilate along with the ventilation this device has to uh, the gel has to move up and down like a minuscule if it is not moving or it is popped off that means your device is not placed in is too high or into the glottis this is one of the test to uh, identify the correct placement of the suprotic uh, prosil uh, next is like this is a test based on based on this test you can identify whether the placement of your device is are correct or a perfect next we will move on to uh, insertion techniques the standard insertion technique for a device as prescribed by archi brain is the digital insertion technique this i would like to demonstrate with the prosil so it, it should be in a sniffing position patient preparation is should be in an adequate plane you should have adequate mouth opening at least 2 uh, cm of uh, mouth opening should be there to pass on the device and the device should be pre use check should be done they should they should be check for a leak and uh, there shouldn't be an obstruction because uh, with the uh, clots or anything because it's a reusable device the device is hold in the insertion tap place and it is inserted along the pallet the idea is to so this is the moment you should get a hyper extension at the interphalangeal joint i'll show you once you place a finger at the place where the the metal handle can fix or your finger can be fixed and the uh, lms the cross lms hold in the device mouth open is achieved sifting position is important mandatory for this you take the mask along the pallet not anteriorly because once you go anteriorly you can tend to drag the uh, tongue and uh, once you place your your fingers over the moment is like your interphalangeal joints is extended and the uh, wrist is flexed so you guide till you get a resistance 
if a finger length is short, you can use your non-dominant hand to place it uh, till you get resistance. And that uh, way to do a thread distal insertion technique. Coming to a bougie carrier technique, which gives a hundred percent success rate. See, I'm passing a bougie into the isobagel. That's a vocal a vocal cord. Is a isobagel opening? I'm placing that. Insert the bougie into the isobagel and railroad the LMA through the drain along the through the drain tube. And that is done till you get resistance. So this gives a success rate, which is close to 100% days. The aim is to place the tip of the cuff at the upper end is a sphincter. So that gives a very good placement and success rate is quite 100% days. Coming to other device, basket mask insertion is quite uh, different. Here, the device is like lubricated on either surface with the water gel, water-based jelly, and the lip is also uh, lubricated. The device is quite bulky, but this is how it's inserted. You get a very good sifting portion, uh, sifting portion just inserted because it's a soft silicon tube. If it, it smoothly squeezes itself into the hypopharynx, so it doesn't require any uh, distal manual mouth opening or a distal insertion technique. So you can insert it within like a few seconds, less than 10, 10 seconds. And the advantage is you can use this drain I mean, suction elbow on the other side, you can pass a uh, so I'm suctioning the drain tube. This is, this is the only device where I can do a hypopharyngeal suction as well as a gastric suction, and you can pass the rail tube. I already passed the rail tube into it. That's advantage of the device. There's a, there's a rail tube on the other side, and uh, this is kept as a vent. You, should, you cannot do a suctioning on both sides. One has to be kept as a vent to avoid mucosal injury. Coming to uh, other like maneuvers where you tend to have resistance or difficulty in placing, especially with an eye gel, uh, in an obese, short neck patient who has got a OSA or a large tongue, in such cases, tongue also tends to move along with the device and it goes to the pharynx, falls to uh, falls on the pharynx and prevents or obstructs the placement of a device. The one technique is like surgically mentioned to, for eye gel, it's called a jaw thrust technique. What you do is you pass the mask cuff, ma, cuff into the mouth and you do a jaw thrust maneuver and simultaneously uh, place the insert the tube inside. This is called jaw, jaw thrust technique, where you expand the pharyngeal space and prevent the tongue falling back. So the device placement is quite successful. Other technique is the tongue retraction technique. Again, this is best for so preform shaped devices like IGEL, where a tongue uh, tongue doesn't allow the placement of a device. Uh, what I do is like with the, my my thumb, or you can use a one blade alone in the laryngoscope blade alone. You retract the tongue away from the palate, and you can pass the tube. So it gives a very good uh, insertion and uh, success rate is quite high. And the other maneuver is called clean maneuver. It was uh, initially described to RQLMA, but can be applied to any other device where, again, I said like where it's an uh, uh, OSA patient or epigotis downfall is suspected or where the patient has got an upper obstruction, which you can identify in during a mass ventilation. What you have to do is ask your assistant to do a jaw thrust. A jaw thrust is done. And the mask is inserted with the mask, you with cuff inflated with the bag uh, ventilation, you just remove the device four centimeter upwards and reinsert it. At one point, you are able to get a, get a very good ventilation with the least resistance. That's the best place to keep it. So mm, the ventilation is good. If you want, that's the best place to uh, uh, intubate as well. If you're at all, you don't have fiber optic bronchoscope to guide your intubation. This is called a clearance maneuver. That is called a use of jaw thrust with an up and down maneuver. Coming to other technique which has been reported, it's an awake insertion technique. I thought instead of trying on a patient, I thought I'll try on myself. Uh, on right side, uh, I'm using a four size basca mask. On left side, it's an ambu or a gain inserted. And this is LMA Supreme, where I added two puffs of 10% uh, uh, zelecan uh, spray. After that, I could uh, manually insert it. The insertion technique doesn't, you no know, need to insert your finger, keep your fingers, insert your fingers distally, just pass on the, along the palate. In all three devices, I could get a very good ventilation. I mean, I very good the spontaneous ventilation. Uh, so I thought uh, instead of trying on a patient, I do, uh, do a awake insertion of myself, able to pass on, we get a very good spontaneous ventilation through it. And with this device, I'm able to pass in a nasogastric tube also. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to try always. La. This can be helpful if you don't have anything, if, in, if it's a patient, uh, patient has a difficult airway. And uh, finally, coming to the uh, advanced applications of devices, the basic applications are use of supply devices to use for a superficial peripheral surgeries, 
or in situations where uh, you're not able to uh, be there in the end and uh, such cases it can be used the basic survey uh, uses but we'll see what are the advanced uses it can be used to as a conduit to intubate it can be as used as a rescue device during less years it can be used as a rescue device in a prone surgery it can be used in pro alposcopy surgeries pediatric surgeries and nasal surgeries we'll see the use of use as conduit to intubate uh, once you inserted ventilation is good, you can do a one-step blind intubation, which will nobody else is going to suggest it because if those patients are around 90 percent age. If there is use of tricot pressure, the success rate drops to 56 percent age. And other technique is the two-step bougie technique. Instead of passing a preloaded, uh, I mean uh, passing a intraocular blindly, what you can do is once a supra device is placed, pass the bougie into it. Once the bougie passes the beglotis, remove the uh, supra device and intubate blindly. This is this is not at all advised because of the uh, trauma which can you which can be caused uh, and uh, which may end up in uh, cannot intubate or cannot ventilate scenario. This advice is to use of abruptic uh, aided intubation. It can be like you can have three types. That is already a preloaded endotracheal tube through a insertion cord of abruptic uh, 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 device. Um, that is called one step fibrotic aided intubation. If that uh, otherwise you can use a two step fibrotic aided intubation. If the tube size is uh, more than seven or eight, there is going to be a play between the endotracheal tube and the insertion cord. So the tube may get caught into a retinoid and it will not be placed. Though the you can visualize the glottis, the intubation is going to be blind. So it can cause injury to a, a arytenoids and other periglottic structure. So what you can do is you can use an intricate, intricate thetris loaded, loaded into fiber optic scope. The intricate is inserted in the vocal cord. Then the fiber optic scope is removed, the LMA is removed, and uh, the spore device is removed, and then the intubation is done. Or you can do a three step fiber optic guided intubation. One is like pass a fiber optic scope first, pass a guide wire through the working channel, remove the fiber optic, pass an airway action catheter through the guide wire, in, and after removal of FOB, then you can intubate through the airway action catheter. This also sounds good when you are not able to pass a tube through a fiber optic scope uh, into a trachea. So these are the ways to intubate uh, through a blood device. Uh, here I can do a single step fiber optic intubation. The first one is like I can visualize my own glottis. Uh, that means the placement is perfect. Another technique is like um, I'm I'm trying to intubate. Uh, I had a like uh, four percent zelic like nebulization and place the uh, ambuar again device into my hypopharynx and uh, my colleague is able to visualize the glottis then the carina. Uh, finally, is able to pass on the tube. The tube is able to pass, and uh, I could see my own carina. Uh, this and uh, this is still possible in a difficult area scenario where you don't want to anesthetize and get into cot. Coming to use of supra device in LSES, there is a meta analysis saying that uh, you can establish airway rapidly with uh, prosil LMA because it's got a gastric drainage. There are a lot of studies coming up. Uh, my uh, the advice is to we keep it as a rescue device in a difficult airway. And same thing, you can intubate through the device, uh, second generation device, anything. Uh, if it is going to be a rescue device, when you're not able to intubate. And uh, the ideal choice will be a second generation device, with an, which has got a very good high oropharyngeal leak pressure. And then a drain tube can be passed, and you can reduce the chance of aspiration. The ideal scenario would be a non obese preferably a faster patient, and relative cases. And the other uh, important advice is ask surgeon not to give excessive fundal pressure because it can cause dislodgement of device as well as uh, chance of regurgitation aspiration is very high. Coming to the use of supra device in a prone question, uh, while do, doing a study or a research on it, I found an Indian article saying that uh, where prosil use, where the PLM prosil LMA induction is done in a pros, prone question, they wanted to show that uh, it required fewer personal insert theater and uh, reduce the surgical readiness, but for me, I wanted to show that uh, if in case uh, endotracheal tube displaces in a prone position, we shouldn't be like uh, go mad. You can always mask ventilate or you can insert a supra device in a prone position, oxygenate. The motto is to oxygenate, not to turn the patient, uh, uh, cover the surgical area, turn it, get the trolley inside, turn the patient, then try to intubate. That is not the goal. So we can mask ventilate or do a supraglottic insertion in the prone position itself. So I wanted to show this as in like a, uh, a conference booster. Say here, what I did is like the advantage is I, I can ask the patient to lie prone on their own uh, way so that they can avoid uh, chest and abdominal compressions. 
once the device is inserted then you can use muscle relaxant and you always keep the trolley alongside so that anything goes wrong you can always turn you turn the patient into the trolley supine then you can intubate here the prosil lma is inserted with almost like neck extension position in the prone uh, position and uh, this is uh, surgery on a heel going on with the prosil inserted and always advise you to use the rails tube through the gastric channel because whenever there is a displacement of this device away from the mouth you can railroad the device through the rails tube again to place it to a uh, in the periglottic area and you can continue ventilation so that's advantage of using the rails tube in this uh, in this cases and as well as you can reduce the chance of aspiration again this works very good in hands of uh, experienced anesthesiologists coming to the use of supra device in laparoscopic surgery is again it studied well there are a lot of like studies and meta analysis done it says that it is clinically more uh, useful as effective as an as an effective airway in laparoscopic surgery uh, the problem here is like when a laparoscopic surgery especially obese patient you need a lot of I mean high peak ventilation pressures so if to ventilate such patients against the diaphragm which is pushed up and uh, so that you need to open up the airway or ventilate with higher pressure if during the process the oropharyngeal leak pressure is very high very less for a particular support device there's a chance of hypoventilation and uh, gastric insufflation reconstitution uh, can occur so that is a problem with an inesplodic device and that occurs that is more unfavorable in uh, obese uh, head low surgery head low gynecology surgeries so what way what is the way to um, overcome is to prefer correct i choose ideal patient in this case i have used a basca mask in an uh, gynecological lap surgery where the patient is almost uh, it is head low is given and there's a suction elbow we can uh, aspirate it aspirate the throat directly and there's a rail tube there's a suction tube where the bile is like coming out and the ventilation is good despite that low uh, all tender tidal volume is like set tidal volume is delivered the air pressure is around 15 cm of water uh, vitals are good saturation is good the et solid trace is good despite having a low flows like around 1.5 liters this is just to show that it can be done but needs a lot of practice and choice of patients and choice of device so the solution is to around use a second generation device with an with the oropharyngeal leak pressure at least uh, greater than 25 cm of water or you what you can do is you can test the oropharyngeal uh, the airway pressure uh, at the uh, supine normal normal ventilation in a under uh, pressure control mode and you keep uh, 8 cm above what you can do is like whatever the ventilation airway pressure is there peak airway pressure in a supine ventilation stage and you can raise the raise the air pressure 8 cm beyond the maximum achievable pressure in a supine position that is a that if the patient the device is able to achieve such a pressure that means that they can withstand the laparoscopy surgery so there won't be any chance of leak or a less chance of aspiration and try to avoid excessive pneumoperitoneum ask the surgeon to limit it to less than 12 maintain adequate play of anesthesia paralyze patient all throughout the procedure and uh, try to avoid a patient who has gotten poor lung complaints or a delayed ga motility again it's very good uh, uh, it's careful and under the experience and going to use of device in pediatric populations generally the success rate on the pediatric populations around varies around 67 to 90 percentage the techniques are uh, for a digital insertion uh, the technique alabula the digital insertion technique which i showed uh, already other technique is like when the problem with the pediatric ventilation is the tongue tends to move backward and uh, there is chance of difficulty in placing or a chance of tongue injury or a tongue swelling when is used in maintain the same position to avoid such problems you can do a 180 degree technique like this so cuff is turned 180 degree towards the palate once it enters the pharynx you can turn and rein uh, place it in a position this is called a 180 degree technique other one is like the suggested the ablation period can assess by pangajendra sir this is in partially inflated Uh, LMA with an insert lateral at angle of 45 degree against the tongue. This is the technique. Partially inflated cuff. Uh, insert a lateral at angle of 45 degree. Once it enters the uh, oropharynx, it's brought into the supine. Uh, I mean, brought into the new uh, noting uh, position. Another technique is you can use a sillated uh, device. Here I pass the sillet into the airway lumen. it becomes assumes like an ilma cavacha or a nasal oropharyngeal cavacha it's almost angular 90 degree once is easy to insert doesn't require your distal uh, fingers to insert it and remove the slit once it's done and uh, take home point with this device devices in children is like use second generation device with the io4 oropharyngeal leak pressure and uh, facility to pass an ng tube 
limit the cuff rest to less than 60, that ideally it should be around 40 to 60. And the better insertion technique to avoid complications will be a partially inflated 45 degree technique, which is quite proven. And uh, finally, coming to use of supra device in a nasal surgery, uh, well, there's a report saying that uh, fear of blood contamination shouldn't preclude the use of LMA. This just, is just to um, say that there's a bath of face mask available uh, in the market. So here, uh, this is a face surgery where I use Basca face mask, which has got two drain tube, I'm attached a suction tube, suction catheter to the uh, suction elbow. So there's a continuous suction of uh, blood uh, happening. Since there is no tube, the hemodynamic response is less, so there's less, of, less chance of uh, bleeding. Uh, I mean, there's decreased bleeding as well. The advantage here is this lumen is, I mean, the air tube is a little short and the connector is a little bent, so which sits on the uh, chin and doesn't come in the pathway of the surgery or endoscopy. Coming to other important advantage of uh, devices, it, it is a Bailey's maneuver. The supra device can be used as a bridging device to extubate just to avoid the uh, intubation, res extubation response, like immunodynamic or respiratory responses, which is more beneficial in a neurosurgical patient or a patient who are poor cardiac complaints or like very low EF, where you want to avoid tachycardia and other uh, immunodynamic responses. In such cases, supra device can, can be used as a bridging device. It's called a Bailey's maneuver. Uh, the uh, compl I mean, contraindication is try to avoid this patient who's got a full stomach. How to use it? It is always done in a deep plane and before giving the reversal. There are ways to do it. First, well, one way is to remove the anti tube and insert the supra device blindly, or you can keep the device in order to be in, in situ and place the supra device like this. Uh, there's a tube is still in situ and the device is placed. And other technique is to railroad an uh, advanced air, I mean, air vacuum catheter into the endotracheal tube, remove the endotracheal tube, and railroad the SGA into it. So that gives an 100% success rate and uh, you can confirm it also. Oh, this is called Bailey maneuver. And uh, finally, as I said, uh, a, a device should have a two essential requirements and one preferential uh, requirement. The preferential requirement is uh, endotracheal intubation. But uh, with the advancement of newer devices, now it can be used as a conduit for an upper geoscopy or an ERCP procedure. So that's an add-on uh, advantage with the advent of uh, LMA gas flow. Here, uh, this is the LMA gas flow. It's a silicon uh, with a bigger cuff, and uh, the, the tip is a little widened. The tip ap aperture is widened, so they can pass an uh, endoscope, a UGA scope or ERCP scope, so that that is inserted through this point that it goes, comes out of the uh, tip, and this port is used to ventilate and can be fixed uh, snugly with use of this tape. And it is this is how it's done. And the LMA, this needs a lot of training that has to be inst uh, inserted. With, with the, the, the insertion is uh, his success is comes with the experience and uh, the tip is little wide and so surgeon needs some experience quite negotiation to pass on the scope uh, through the esophagus because the esophageal opening could be collapsed because of the placement of the device they need some experience to pass on this otherwise it's quite safe uh, procedure where it's it comes in between endotracheal intubation and sedation sometimes sedation will, may go wrong in an obese patient in such case, uh, cases where you want to avoid uh, endotracheal intubation because of their neurosurgery or a cardiovascular problem, uh, it can be used, but it comes handy with an experience and uh, here, here they are able to pass the endoscope, endoscope through this uh, port quite easily. So this has to be like, studied a lot and probably one of the devices for future. Finally, from exam point of view as well as the practice point of view, some of the points to be remembered. Uh, for a successful placement and use of a super device, patient selection is important. Uh, in elective cases or any other cases, right, the contrary is for a super device is around, it's called, the mnemonic is called ROTS. It, it cannot be placed in a restricted mouth opening or a patient has got an obstructed airway or any mass in the pathway of a super device or any distorted airway and an, uh, a congenital abnormality or any other issues. Our patient has got a stiff lung. That is, patient has got a very poor lung. So we need a lot of high airway pressure to ventilate such patient. There, the chance of displacement and uh, gas insufflation is very high. So this is the place you have to try to avoid uh, supraoral devices. In emergency situations, supraoral device role is mainly rescue device when the endotic intubation or oxygenation is failed. The patient portion, the ideal suggested portion will be stiffing portion, but depends upon the device and the manufacturer's advice. The insertion technique, it's a standard distal insertion technique is used for a uh, cuff devices. Uh, for the device which is preformed shape and always, 
Uh, it depends upon each device and your experience. Session, I would like to fix the device first to the maxilla because maxilla is immobile compared to mandible because mandible just at the moment it can be more mobile, it can cause slight display, displacement. Angle to angle through the maxilla is always uh, preferred. And uh, do not use the gastric tunnel when there is an upper GA bleed or an, is an excessive RA leak or a isovel varices to try to avoid the injury to the uh, isovel varices. And uh, coming to ventilation, limit the ventilation to 6 to 8 ml per gauge. You don't try to achieve higher air pressure. If there is a leak, try to re reduce the ventilation uh, tidal volume to 6 to 8 ml, deepen the plane of anesthesia. Uh, air pressure, which is like try to avoid higher air pressures and limited, depends upon the orifice leak pressure of the patient and of the tube and the uh, morphology of the patient and the surgery. And finally, removal technique, uh, it's better to always wait for the full recovery patient to be conscious and muscle action uh, if used should be required, should be like uh, uh, required from the muscle, like, uh, muscle action and uh, till the patient becomes very awake because patient can still tolerate an inspired device when compared to an tube. And uh, final important advice is there are empty number of devices in the market. It's not necessary you have to do research, find each and everyone and use one device for a particular surgery or a uh, particular set of patients. Find out what is the best available device, which is available in your area. Try to get familiarized with that and gain enough clinical experience so you can use according to it, it instead of searching for a better devices. Thank you for your uh, patient listening. Uh, and I thank uh, organizers like uh, Edward, Edward sir and uh, Rajesh sir for this opportunity. Hope I did some justice. Uh, I'm open for other questions, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Excellent presentation. Dr. Raji, sir. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram Kumar. It was a very excellent presentation. Can you hear me, Ram? Uh, I can hear you, sir. Tell me, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have some questions for you. No problem. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Sendhil is there along with you? Yeah, he's there. He's there. Uh, first, I'll let me finish. Uh, one question is there pending for Dr. Sendhil. Uh, Sendhil... Uh, yes, sir. The, the difference between the yes, yes, metallic tube which you showed us. Yes, yes, yes. And, no, and, 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 the, the old reflex metallic tube was uh, not having a Murphy sizer. Second thing is uh, the bevel of the tube is little blunt. Nowadays, whatever the flex metallic tube which is available is little sharper bevel. It's similar to like Parker flex tube because we are uh, mostly using it for nasal intubation. So for negotiation, the bevel has been little sharper. The second basic important difference is uh, the cuff, the old reflex tube, the cuff is of uh, low volume and high pressure cuff, whereas the nowadays uh, available uh, flex tube is of uh, uh, low pressure and high volume cuff. These are all the three, three basic difference between the older and the present uh, generation flex tube. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Shall I move on to the questions to Ram Kumar? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, uh, the she, uh, you have discussed about the failure, IGEL failure. Yes. Dr. Prema is asking about causes of IGEL failure in failed intubation scenario. Failed intubation scenario depends upon what is the cause for the intubation, sir. Failure of intubation is it's then uh, device failure or the uh, difficult anatomy or the oxygenation, sir. Uh, if the if you go along go uh, as per the guidelines of in Indian airway, airway guidelines or in uh, USR, if there is intubation failure, next uh, choice or next uh, point in the algorithm is to use a support device. In that scenario, IGEL will be an ideal situation because it's already a preformed LM device and the placement is very uh, easy and the flexibility of the gel is like it able to mold or like conform to the periodic structure. The seal is also better, sir. One disadvantage is in a MN scenario, the size of uh, flex, I mean, uh, nasogastric tube through, which can be used through IGEL is little smaller when compared to other device. So we can aspirate the liquid contents, but solid content is difficult to do. But at the same time, basca mass, you can aspirate the solid content directly. But uh, the ideal choice will be depend upon what kind of failure with the intraocular intubation. If it's going to be unable to visualize or unable to see the glottis, unable to ventilate, again, the chance of Failure of any other spot is always there, but uh, you can try adjust. Uh, you can do some maneuvers and try to oxygenate the patient before you get in get the senior help or the fibroid device to um, actually into secure the airway. So it buys you the time, sir. I tell this better. Madam, ha Madam had a, got a intubation uh, difficulty in patient with malignant class four. That is where he, she had a problem in 
inserting the igel also will it will that correlate mallam patti sir, classification in, in class 4 uh, i can agree with the with the normal insertion techniques uh, if it fails uh, we can do this jaw thrust technique or the uh, tongue retraction technique so uh, idea is to get the device mask into the oropharynx uh, once it is gone we can push it in till you get resistance or what you can use you can use a laryngoscope blade till the, you can pass on the blade lift the tongue away from the uh, palate and you can introduce the mask sir so it still will be useful when there is an mpc4 and difficult uh, intubation uh, the next question is uh, is it the application of gel essential for all supraglottic airway devices you showed about busca mask is it yeah. for eye gel for eye gel all devices i mean i didn't go to each and every step sir it is a separate topic application of gel is almost mandatory the advice suggestion is to do a water based jelly for a smooth uh, uh, insertion of an any device because it has to go to along the palate along the postpharyngeal wall and it has to enter the tip of the uh, end apparent of the esophageal and uh, apparent is apparent of the esophagus so gel is almost mandatory basca mask they suggest lubrication on either side both anterior as well as uh, posterior side as well as the lip for easy insertion without opening the mouth that's the so difference is, with that device so this question is from professor dr edward johnson sir Uh, basca mask is it available for pediatrics and uh, various sizes of basca mask available right now it's soluble from 2 and 1/2 3 4 and 5 sir size 1 and 1 and 1/2 it's in the process of uh, making i know dr basca personally sir i i used to work along with him i i is quite 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 friend of mine we know we were like we have there are a couple of changes also like we used to share and discuss uh we last discussion was lutemus is in the process of devising almost device uh, it has to come to the market one and one and half size uh the maximum uh, time number of number of time the lma classic can be reused classic it it's in silicon reusable 40 times sir the manufacturer advice is 40 times because because of the it is the selection technique advised is autoclave steam autoclave so we have to uh, autoclave up to uh, like 140 degrees celsius so 137 degrees is for 10 minutes of hold so because it is repeated the autoclave there is some wear and tear and with the patient use wear and tear is there so company suggestion is around 40 uh, certain silicon devices go up to 60 times sir uh, I, I, one question i'll combine both maximum duration of lma usage both with spontaneous ventilation and controlled ventilation how long we can spontaneous ventilation it depends sir uh, depends upon the anesthetic we use and the patient's uh, ventilation capacity as plain depends uh, opioid usage the respiratory drive is going to come down and uh, but so far there is no any textbook or and review article description so this is the prescribed limit beyond which you cannot use i gel the manufacturer himself advised not to use both in beyond 4 hours we have used for laparoscopy surgery a combined laparoscopic surgery for like 6 hours there is a report or a documentation in bedum of up to 12 hours i mean 9 to 12 hours there is a report saying that it is used for like one day uh, icu ventilation but uh, no textbook advice described or a, a, a guideline saying that this is the time limit because each device that's a problem with the super device there are multi multi number of devices with different uh, materials pvc silicon thermoplastic elastomer so there is no common point sir can we take this as uh, for postgraduate check maximum for us Ah, Igel, Igel, you can go into their uh, man recommendations is for us. For us, okay. Um, as you uh, quoted that supraglottic airway devices for LSCS, uh, which uh, supraglottic airway device uh, will be good as a rescue in LSCS? Sir, from exam point of view, it's Prozil. Why? Pro-seal, because yeah. it's tested, tested. Sir, a lot of evidence saying that Prozil can be used because of the cuff, and uh, two cuffs to because of drain tube. and uh, the experience because you use tend to use classical lm insertion technique so the same technique applies to it so easy to insert provided it should be available but again i suggest if any other supraglottic device with a drain tube and with a very good oropharyngeal leak pressure more than 30 cm of water and uh, that device can be used this is only the device part the other part is the patient side sir how fast it how emergency or pin pregnancy manipulation of abdomen portion of neck uh, all this come to come to the play which is non controllable the controllable is the device that is second generation device uh, pro seal is time tested sir okay one last question ram um, yes, is when we uh, use muscle relaxants in a patient with uh, supraglottic airway device 
should we reduce the dose of muscle relaxant I, it's like uh, no major difference sir once you reduce la my suggestion is to use if you you find it like going to be difficult insertion you can use the full dose of uh, the intubated dose of in the first attempts and the subsequent maintenance is not required because even if you reduce the dose so if instead of like um, 0.5 of atracarim use 0.2 mg per kg but the waiting time for the muscle recovery to occur we have to wait for the same duration so what is suggest is probably use the first dose Uh, to the full and you try to avoid or you time it or you based upon the patient's recovery and the movement you can give this uh, you can avoid the subsequent doses but again there is no like textbook they can recommendations to say that uh, you cannot use reduce use because you may end up in inadequate plane again if it's for laparoscopic use i can cut and dry say you can use full dose you want muscle rec- relaxation for the surgical purpose thank you thank you very much uh, dr ram kumar and dr sendil kumar because both of you have brought a workshop uh, like uh, this thing to us in, on our screen it's excellent presentation from both of you and most useful for all the post graduates i think almost i uh, covered up all the chat questions if at all anything is being left i'll personally message you and get the answers uh, from you uh, edward sir do you want to add up any points sir no sir nothing else sir wonderful presentation sir thank you sir you are loaded with uh, some practical tips so that is a highlight of your presentation thank you so much and uh, the pa- participants questions also are excellent that shows the participants involvement in your presentation so thank you so much sir so we, with that we will come to the end of this session we will meet next week with uh, critical care topics thank you uh, rajesh sir thank you thank you thank you thank you and also i thank the a1 logics akrula sponsors and also anasisya tv thank you thank you ananda we will meet thank next you. Week. thank you